Pennsylvania and welcomes guests from across the globe to discuss important topics of interest. Here's Father Tom. Welcome to Ancient Faith Today Live. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. We'll be taking your calls in a bit at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. Bobby Maddox will be answering your calls tonight, so please make sure to turn the show volume off before you come on air. To participate online, we're streaming both the AFM Facebook and YouTube pages. You can make comments there, but the easiest way is right from your phone. You can send us a text message to 412-206-5012. That's right. During this live show, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, you can send us a text message to 412-206-5012. As always, you can send us an email at aft at ancientfaith.com, but we'd love to hear your voice at one eight five five af radio So let's get started. The Christian message is good news. The news that Christ has destroyed sin and death through his own death. He overcomes it because he is the source of life. We participate in that as renewed humans. Christians, uh, before baptism, we were dead in sin. But after baptism and chrismation, we are alive in Christ. We're constantly partakers of this new life in the church. Little by little, the old man in us is dying away. And we are, hopefully, being conformed to the likeness of God by His grace, living out, once again, the very goal of human existence, that is, to become God by grace. But this process of growing in virtue isn't magical. St. Paul describes the common struggle of us all so vividly in Romans 7. He speaks about it as warfare. He says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he gives the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So yes, it is a war, but what we're here to talk about tonight is that it is a war that is winnable. Winning the virtues. We're going to talk about it with a dear friend of this show, Father Paul Janakas. Father Paul is the rector of St. Luke Orthodox Church in Palos Hills, Illinois, and he's also the chancellor of the Diocese of the Midwest in the Orthodox Church in America. He's a graduate of Concordia College and St. Vladimir Seminary. He holds dual master's degrees in community and addictions counseling. He's also a licensed professional counselor for the Ethos Counseling Group. Dear friend, Father Paul Janakis, welcome back to Ancient Faith Today. Thank you, Father Thomas. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very, very happy that you're here. And this is such an important topic. So tell me, why are the virtues so important? And and also, uh, the title, you know, you submitted this title. Why Mm -hmm. are we talking about winning the virtues? This is a phrase that is actually used by the Holy Fathers and the saints in our church. And y- your introduction was just really marvelous. And we, we do have to fight the good fight. And, and the Christian life is a life that we can only live by grace. It's, it's humanly impossible. And it's something that we make possible only by the power of God and especially with the virtues. And, you know, this has been a subject or a topic that's interested me because 
I remember being a very young priest. And so maybe I can just begin with a little story. I, I was sure. uh, you know, graduating from the seminary. I was newly ordained. I was 25 or 26 years old. And I, I was an assistant priest at uh, this very wonderful, uh, very large parish, St. Mary's Cathedral in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And my first year there, um, I remember kind of thinking about myself and my priesthood after after my first year. And I had found that I was kind of in, in not in a place of despair, but a place of questioning because I had exhausted just in that first year all of the knowledge that I had learned at seminary. I had done my <laughs> preaching and I had done my teaching. And I was just kind of, it was like I had played all my cards out. You know, all 52 yeah, yeah. cards were down on the table. And and right. I I was I I I it caused me to question not not my priesthood, but what exactly am I mm -hmm. supposed to be doing? And after a bit of prayer and a, and a bit of some serious kind of soul searching, it just it just dawned on me. You know, even though it had been you know there in front of my face all along, as as priests and as pastors, we are in the business. Of teaching, uh, of teaching and mentoring virtue, and and these are the virtues of Christ. This is the life in Christ. But I have very good friends who who are are attorneys. They're in the business of justice. I have very good friends who are are teachers in the classroom, and they're in the business of education. I have very good friends who are doctors and and nurses, and they're in the business of healing. And I have no problems, you know, in, in, in saying this, you know, um, boldly that we are in the business of winning virtue, both for ourselves and for, for uh, the people that we serve. And, and then it became clear to me, you know, as the years went on, that it's a very clear-sighted, it's a very clear-sighted thing. We have these teachings that are summarized for us, for example, in, in the you know, in in the Sermon on the Mount, basically, and of, of course, in the in the in the writings of Saint Paul, that tell us what it means exactly to be one in Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What this new life in Christ means about which you mm -hmm. spoke, having died to self, died to sin, died to the flesh, died to the passions. Um, this new life in Christ means that we also. And and here's where we kind of get into the the really nitty gritty. We participate in all of the goodness of God Himself mm. incarnate in Christ. Mm. So by virtue of the well, by virtue by virtue of the incarnation, we mm. are now able to participate in these divine virtues and thereby regain or recover our humanity. And so as I began to, you know, uh, think about this, you know, why do we have this thing in our church called the communion of the saints? We commemorate the saints, we read the saints, we celebrate the saints, you know, we learn from the saints. Why do we do that? Well, of course, it's because this is the gospel that comes alive in them, but the saints are given to us in order to show us, here are these Christian virtues on display in every single one of them, and that we too are given that that invitation uh, to 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 win these good things in, in our own lives. Father Paul, I, I want to um, before we talk about the the process of winning these virtues, I want to unpack a little bit, especially for maybe our listeners who are not Orthodox or our listeners who are orthodox and might maybe misunderstand. So let me sure. let me set up a, a scenario for you. And someone, I think this is very common among just general people. They will say when someone dies or, you know, just talking about uh, the general disposition of people, you say, well, he's a good person. Or right. uh, this person died. They were such a good person. They're going to go to heaven because they were a good person. And, you know, someone from a, a certain faith tradition might object and say, well, look, you know, being a good person is not what's going to, quote unquote, get you to heaven. 
It's not going to save you. So what I want to ask you is first, what is the place of virtue? In other words, you're going to talk about virtue, but but what I want you to do is say, why? Why is it important that we lead virtuous lives? Isn't it just, isn't it enough for us to say, I believe in Christ, I trust in Christ, I'm a sinner, um, and and I'm repenting, and look, I'm doing the best that I can. I was kind of built this way. I'm I'm an unhappy person, or yeah. you know, I'm angry yeah. or whatever. I can't do anything about it. And uh, look, who's to say anyway? Don't judge me. So you know what what's the point of cultivating a virtuous life if it if it doesn't matter? Yeah. So or that's, does that's it matter? Really- and it, and it it really it's a really important question, and the answer to that question I would say is this: that as human beings, our lives are dynamic. There's something about human life and all life, as a matter of fact, that ha- there, there's a there's a there's a dynamic quality to this, and and we are either moving forward or we are going to be moving backward, right? Uh, we are either going to be growing in you know life and faith and spiritual understanding which is that beautiful prayer that we say at every liturgy of of saint john chrysostom or we are going to be you know in in a state of you know spiritual emotional moral psychological and physical disintegration so i would answer that question by saying if we really want to live right if we really want to stay alive and and make you know, a good offering of ourselves to God, then we're going to have to be very serious about what it means to to mm-hmm. to gain these virtues, each of them in our own unique way, which I'm hoping that we can talk about a little bit. My theory is that the saints are given to us in order to show us that some of our, they're, they all display virtues, but some of them really struggled with, you know, some some mm. uh, a few of them and then you know some of them really you know were were just you know off the charts with with other of these virtues but the way that they gain their virtues through you know through their journey of life and and the challenges and the opportunities and the gifts that god had given them uh you know is just fascinating to me but mm-hmm. the answer to the question is if we want to stay alive we have to be serious about our growth growth in christ and that you know to 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 believe in Christ, to believe in the Lord, and, and to follow Him is exactly you know to put Him on, and and we can only do that by you know of course dying to the old, so that we can start living and actually practicing and and learning these virtues. And that's why you know when when I speak about the virtues either in my my own adult education classes or, or when I'm preaching on on Sunday mornings or the other feast day services do we we have to kind of relate them also to to repentance you know because you know every one of those virtues you know has an opposite and the opposite of those virtues virtues are the vices or vices. or what we would call the passions or even the fathers are, are going to call them demons and there's a reason for that too, but but maybe if we have time to get to it, we can we can we can talk about it. But for okay, example, so let's say yeah. well, let be, before we get to the before we're, we're going to start with the virtues, but Good. let's remind our listeners first: one eight five five AF radio. That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six, or send us a text to four one two two zero six five zero one two. Maybe you are struggling with uh, cultivating certain virtues. Maybe you're constantly falling in to, to certain passions. Uh, we would love to hear from you. You don't have to give your name. You can speak uh, uh, anonymously, that's fine, or send us a text. Uh, maybe you're a priest and you're dealing with a parishioner and you want some uh, priestly advice from one of our uh, foremost priests in the Orthodox Church in America, give us a call. We would love to hear from you. All right, uh, so Father Paul, Tell, tell us what the virtues are, first of all. Okay, very good. 
So let's let's list them out. There's seven or eight of them according to the fathers, and these some these are pretty much um, these are pretty much uh, um, that we might even call them canonical in the sense that they're regularized. But they there's a little bit of difference. But they are beginning with the first humility, and humility according to the teaching of our church is the mother of all the virtues. Um, we have to begin with humility, and then we might go on. Number two charity number three mercy number four chastity number five temperance or self-control number six diligence or sometimes what they call what we can call faithfulness number seven gratitude or, or what uh, the some of the fathers would call contentment and number eight would be patience and mm. and so uh, those are those are um those are the virtues that that we are to be working on in in our in our life of of growth and it's intimately related to repentance um because as i mentioned before if we fail in 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 these virtues we end up enslaved to the passions so let's just take a, a good example of one of them sure let's talk about okay. humility if we fail yeah. in our humility um we end up prideful. And that pride is, of course, separation from God. If we fail in temperance or self-control, then what do we end up with? We end up being a glutton. If we fail in our diligence, then what happens is we end up with lethargy and laziness. If we fail in our gratitude or, or being content, this is a very interesting one, right? Then we then we end up envious of others, right, and bitter, you know. So yeah. so what we say is that we're we're in the we're in the middle of these things, right? And and right. here's a wonderful quote from Saint John of Damascus, and this is what originally got the ball rolling for me. So so listen to this. He says these sure. eight passions, which are the opposite of the virtues, should be destroyed as follows: gluttony by self control unchastity by desire for God and longing for the blessings held in store, avarice for compassion for the poor, almsgiving, that is, anger by mercy and love for all men, dejection or despondency by joy, listlessness by patience, perseverance and offering of thanks to God, self-esteem or pride by doing good in secret and by praying constantly with a contrite heart, and pride by the refusal to judge or despise anyone in the manner of the boastful Pharisee and by considering oneself the least of all men. So what he's actually saying is that a, a, a passion and a virtue are not really opposites because they're not equal. What he's saying is that, as I mentioned, every passion is a failed virtue because if, if we lose this good thing, these good things, if we lose those good things that God gives to us, you know, then then we end up with something that is, um, you know, a, um, you know, is is a distortion, you know, of of its original. Um, and this is why, you know, um, we would look at it in this way. So let let me ask you, because you're speaking about this, uh, this uh, a kind of um... Uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? There, there's a kind of scale, right? Uh, yeah. There, there, there is a way in which if you're not hum if you're not humble, then you are prideful. So humility is on one side of the scale. Correct. Pride, which is the 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 matching passion, is on the other side of the scale. Correct. Does that mean? Does that mean when we are listing these virtues the these great virtues that essentially everyone has these to a certain measure in in one aspect of their life or another we are displaying these characteristics uh, of either humility or pride of charity or greed of mercy, or I, I'm not sure what you know, uh, of, or, or of judgment, being judgmental, or or, um, or judgmentalness. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, yeah. Are, are you saying that that it's it's kind of like inescapable? Is that correct? Yeah. Exactly, in the sense that um, 
you know, these virtues are, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are, the, they are the qualities of the divine humanity of Christ. If we, if we fail to achieve these virtues, then we basically we, we lose something of our humanity in them. Um, mm. you know, and that's what sin means. It means missing the mark. We miss the mark of humility you know, by falling into you know, um, uh, vainglory and pride. Um, we miss the mark of, of being pure by, by you know, giving in to, to lustfulness or, or you know, by, by being irritable with others and, and not practicing patience. But so, so this is what we also have, you know, thank God, Father Thomas, right? The sacrament of holy confession. Because in, in his providence, I really believe that, you know, we, we don't really have to ask for any of these virtues. God is giving us a test. Our, our life course is filled with these kind of tests where we have to face our passions so that with his help and with his grace, we can have those passions healed in order to become virtues. And if we turn to Saint, another one of my favorite saints who, who writes extensively on this, Saint Maximus the Confessor, you know, I would highly recommend, you know, everyone reading his his um, his book Centuries on Love. And in this book, a hundred mm, chapters on yes. love, he says every sinful passion is a movement of human nature in the wrong direction. That's what we're talking about. So that if our humanity is moving in its proper direction, then we are we are moving and we're growing into virtues. So the problem with the demons, you know, and, and our our fallen human nature is that we, we will gravitate, unfortunately, you know, to to these um to, to these vices. Uh, but our whole life is filled with tests every day. You know, um, right. uh, temptations, uh, adversities, right. where the Lord is giving us, you know, um, the opportunity to to grow and to learn, um, and and that's that's a wonderful thing. But that's why we're also calling, you know, calling this show "Winning the Virtues." Yeah, you know? yeah. And so, you know, we talk so, about winning the war, but we lose the battle sometimes, right. don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so right now you're you're kind of painting the the framework. You're painting the picture to say there are these seven great virtues, and there they are. Um, there there is a, a kind of scale uh, that uh, we fall on that is an expression of either a virtue or passion, and our idea is to kind of move the needle toward toward the virtues to cultivate those and we're going to I, I i i'm hoping father paul that we can go into each one of the virtues is that possible it surely is and i was hoping okay. we could All right. do as many of them quickly as possible we, we will do that so but i want to ask you first because an interesting question came in on our uh youtube stream so cr asks and and why i find this interesting a question is it's not naming one of the virtues. So what I want you to do is to kind of like answer this question in terms of, okay, what, what virtues are pushing someone toward this particular behavior? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, or, 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 or passions, I should say. All right. So CR asks, how do you tackle unforgiveness? For example, Example, forgiving those who have deeply hurt you. How do you forgive even your yourself? I often feel like I pick that up. Very good. Uh, so let's let's go down. Let's go and let's let's move on. Let's move and talk exactly. about the, the, the virtue of mercy. So great. You know, mercy is to pass on the 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 great the mercy of God. You know, um, and you know, we have it in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts as, as we forgive those who are indebted to us. But, you know, practicing this, this virtue, it, we realize that it's a lifelong journey. Forgiveness itself is a journey. And we begin that journey by wanting to forgive. You know, our teacher, Father Tom Hopko, used to say it even like this. He would say, we begin the, the virtue of mercy we we begin forgiveness by wanting 
to want to forgive, you know, because we may really be hurt. And, and I speak about this quite often, not only from my ambo, but especially in, in, in my counseling. We go through life and, and we find ourselves betrayed by others, deeply wounded by others. Sure. And, and sure. we will carry that no matter what. But the, the key to mercy and to our own healing is to be able to let it go and to be give it uh, and to be uh, and just to give it up, you know, and not letting the things that happened in the past keep us as a slave to the past. So we have to be patient with ourselves. You know, that's a good example, I think, of if even just, you know, patience. But, you know, recognizing that, you know, when we're hurt, we're angry. And it's the hurt that drives the anger. Sometimes it's fear that drives, you know, drives anger, but very often, you know, it's hurt that drives the anger. And we have to look at that ill will and we have to say something like, Lord, I hate my ill will. I am powerless over this. Please take it from me. That's mm-hmm. wanting to forgive, wanting to forgive, you know. And then there's the other one, you know, which is that, you know, um, we are able, you know, to love our enemies ultimately, you know, through this kind of spiritual amnesia. We, we have forgive and forget. We usually don't forget. But remember, we lose ourselves in Christ. And, and we don't even see, you know, we don't see ourselves. We see Christ. And, and so all of that, you know, is cleansed you know, that anger, that hurt, you know, because of the grace of God and because, you know, Christ is, um, you know, Christ is there. You know, when we're in a situation of abuse, it, emotional abuse, God God forbid it's physical abuse, you know, we have to really take the steps to, 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 um, to get healthy, to get well. And um, we can also think of this as an opportunity given to us from God in order to learn mercy to win mercy. You know, one of those sins that we confess in St. John of Kronstadt's, you know, um, general confession, you know, is the sin of the remembrance of wrong, you know? And and that's a failure of mercy right. because we're looking back at when somebody did to us, and it could be months, it could be years, but we're holding on to that remembrance of wrong because in a way it gives us some kind of really sick pleasure and even maybe subconsciously or unconsciously it's a way of of showing some kind of you know power you know over them you did this to me and now i right. have the the now i have the right to stand on my pedestal you know and and mm-hmm. claim myself as being more morally superior um, it's interesting yeah. that that CR brings up the idea is how do you forgive even yourself? And, um, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, well, you know, look at Ephesians 4.32, uh, you know, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you, right? Yeah, um, right. And, and this is this is very important. But what if you don't feel forgiven? Like, like you, you obviously, if you can't forgive yourself, there's obviously some kind of, I don't know, what is it? Trauma? Is it sure, uh, yeah. uh, something that happened that, that you, you feel constant shame or, or whatever it is? Right, right. You know, we've talked about this on, on, I can't remember one of our other shows, the difference, Father Thomas, between shame and guilt. I think that there's a world of difference between that. Guilt is a good thing or should be a good thing in the sense that it motivates us to repent, you know, because of the love of God and his and his kindness and mercy towards us. Shame is from the mouth of the devil, you know, who is going to tell us that we are these, you know, we are we are these lost human beings and that there's no hope for us. You know, that's the despair, the godless despair. And we, you know, we all face that voice, you know, Um, you know, but the other thing about this uh, forgiveness and self-forgiveness, we we don't want to fall into, you know, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I did it. I know I'm, I'm, I I just made a mistake where we just kind of diminish it or, or, or whitewash it. But on the other hand, 
there, there is kind of a secret pride about you know this kind of refusal to forgive oneself because mm. I didn't measure up to my own moral standard. And, and mm. that's a very kind of insidious thing. You know, I'm not as holy as I wanted to be. And, and, and because of this, you know, I can't achieve this, this high state. I'm going to, I'm going to loathe. Yeah. Interesting. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And like a perfectionist attitude it, it or something. Right. But it's also something that really drives it in recovery. When I work with my, you know, my addicts and my alcoholics, you know, that's a very deep seated thing. You know, the, the shame and hmm. this inability to forgive oneself. But that's because something is missing, you know, in terms of really knowing how much we are loved and cherished by God mm -hmm. and that this forgiveness is given to us as long as we have faith and we, we truly ask and beg God for that mercy, for forgiveness, with the qualification, of course, that, that we are, are willing to change, you know, willing to learn their virtues you know, um, and, and to, and, you know, to make, you know, to make these kind of transformations, you know, okay. but without the love of God as the foundation in our lives, we leave ourselves open to every crazy demonic, sure. you, you know, suggestion that that has to do with all of our, you know, our failures in, in life. Um, and as a, all right. Also, yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. I know it's just going to say to that, you know, psychologically, for some reason, the mind itself likes to superglue itself to negative things, mm, you know, right. and, and I think there's something demonic in that, too. I think it's I think it's both, you know, neurological and spiritual working Agreed. together. Agreed. You know, but yeah, the, the know, devil loves that. Yeah, he just loves that, you know, and, and we are only going to think of uh, the sin or see this. But, you know, there's this sense that in the liturgy and confession we come to Christ, we give ourselves up wholly to him, we lose ourselves in Christ. And when that happens, we no longer see ourselves. We see Christ. We are no longer aware of, of, of what our sins are. We know what our sins are, but we're, we're not having to regurgitate them over and over and over. And that's why, you know, I love that psalm verse that we sing, you know, in the antiphons, you know, as far as the East is from the West, so yep. far does the yep. Lord remove our transgressions mm -hmm. from us. That's a statement of faith. You know, yep. as far as the East is from the West. Yeah. You know, if God can that, forgive you that much, why can't, can't you? Why can't you? Right? Well, it must be because there's, uh, there's some pride. There's still some pride that's there somewhere. All right. All right. Let's take a quick break here. Uh, we will encourage everyone to give us a call at one eight five five AF radio or send us a text to four one two two zero six five zero one two CR on uh, YouTube. I hope that was helpful to you. When we come back, we're going through all of the virtues and we're going to unpack them a little bit. And Father Paul's going to give us some tips. We will be right back. Father Tom will be back in a moment. In the meantime, the lines are open at 855-237-2346. Don't go away. Hi, this is Father Evan Armitas, and I have to tell you that writing a book for Ancient Faith Publishing called Toolkit for Spiritual Growth was one of the greatest experiences I've had in the last 10 years. I learned so much through that process. And you know, it brought up other ideas, other topics I wanted to cover. One of them was on the Great Commission of Christ and what that means for us personally, what that means for us in our communities, in our parishes, in our small group ministries as leaders. And so off I went, did a lot of thinking and soul searching and wrote a book called Reclaiming the Great Commission, A Roadmap to Parish Health. Now, I don't want you to think about this book as something that's just for parish priests or parish council members or board members or ministry leaders. I think this is a book for everybody. You know, I tell a lot of stories and anecdotes about, you know, my life as a Christian, my life as a priest and the experiences and the things that so many faithful people have taught me. And I try to compile all those anecdotes and, and a lot of information about what it means to be part of the Great Commission, what it means 
not only through the words of Christ, I think almost all the quotations in this book come from the Gospels and Holy Scripture, but also the things that I've learned from great mentors, you know, whether that was my childhood priests, whether that was other brother clergy or faithful Christians that I've met through the years, and even a professional coach that I've been seeing for a long time who's taught me so much about how to lead. And, you know, of course, probably most importantly, the words that my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught and commanded me, you know, to go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you even to the close of the age. I hope you'll pick up a copy, you know, not only for your community, but for yourself. And together, we can go about this reclaiming of the Great Commission. You can find it now at store.ancientfaith.com. We're back with Ancient Faith Today and Father Tom Soroka. Give us a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Father Tom. Welcome back. We're talking with Father Paul Janakis about the virtues and how to win them. We're going to start unpacking the virtues now, Father Paul. Let's start with humility. How do we Very cultivate good. humility? So we don't have to go far in order to learn or win any of these virtues because the Lord is giving us a, a lifetime. It's a school. Our, our lives are, are, are a school of, of virtue. Um, and things happen to us, I really believe, happen to us by providence, where we can gain virtue, you know, uh, through these these kind of events. But let's let's mm. kind of let's talk about what virtue is. Let's talk about I'm sorry. Let's talk about what what humility, you know, humility, as I mentioned, you know, is the is the mother of all the virtues. But we would say this, that humility is a true and accurate knowledge of who and what we are in the eyes of God. Let me say that again. Humility mm. is a true and accurate knowledge of who and what we are in the eyes of God. And we usually speak of this in terms of, you know, knowing what our sins are. You know, the Desert Fathers have a famous saying, you know, um, I don't remember which which father it was, um, but he he you know he said that the man who knows his sins has accomplished a greater miracle than a man who raises another from the dead. That tells me that this must be a pretty difficult thing to really see you know see and know our sins, you know, and how do we go about? you know, knowing ourselves and knowing what our sins are, you know, well, we have to overcome our self-love, not, not the healthy self-love, but the, <laughs> but the prideful kind of, of self-regard. And, and the problem with that is that it blinds us from our sins, right? And it, it may not be just kind of extreme arrogance, like, you know, people toss around the word narcissism, all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's just maybe I think oh, I think it's just too much, you know. But it, it's about not seeing ourselves as we really are, especially with what our our faults and and our passions are. We may have a sense of those being there, but we do not see them to the degree that we need to in in order to really be motivated uh, to change. Um, and and that is something that is is very destructive. And also, let, pride, let me ask you. I just want to ask you a question here because often what happens and and let's let's think about for instance uh, we have professional people in our congregations people that have to let's take like a lawyer right so yeah. uh, a lawyer has to be anything but humble right he he uh, at, at least in the world's understanding right when we sure. think about humility or meekness, I don't think about a lawyer. Like if I need a lawyer, I want a guy or a woman that's going to be just mm -hmm. like a lion that's going mm -hmm. to, you know, go mm -hmm. after the opponent sure. or whatever. So how does someone 
that it, let's say working in business, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they are they they, they love their business, but they have maybe certain authority and they feel like they can't show any kind of meekness or humility. How do you instill humility in someone that feels like they can't really be Excellent. humble? I, I would have them redefined or what we call in the counseling world, reframe that into something that we could call kind of good self-confidence. And to be confident of oneself can be prideful. It certainly could be, you know, prideful okay. in a sense we are boasting, you know, of all of our successes, right? And St. Paul brings yeah, that up, right. you know, in his second letter to the Corinthians. But also, I think there's a, a good self-confidence when we are able to use as best we possibly can the gifts that God has given to us. And I have very good friends that are attorneys, and my oldest son is a lawyer. And, um, you know, oh, wow. I, I, you know, it is, I would say that we should be zealous for truth. We should be zealous for justice, because that's, that's what our courts are for. You know, in, in the first place, you know, um, uh, to 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 do the right thing. And so, you know, in, in those, I think in those kind of arenas, our faithful who have these callings to be an attorney, uh, to, to be, you know, in some of these other kind of rough and tumble occupations, and you're a, a, absolutely right, where there might have to be a little bravado, um, you can take that bravado, and again, you know, I think dedicate it, dedicate it to God and, and let it become something, you know, of, of this, this zeal, you know, Good. Christ was zealous to do his, his father's work. Good. Um, and and yeah. so this is where, uh, again, we're, we're turning a, a, a passion or a vice into a virtue. And, and love it. All right. Think, yeah. Let's let, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to, we, we want to get through all of these. So can we move sure. on to charity and talk about the the role of charity and what is the the vice or the passion that uh, charity uh, awesome. when, when charity does not exist? So, you know, one of the big aspects in our Orthodox Church and in, in our, our way of life has to do with uh, charity and we would call it in doing good works to the poor. Um, but sometimes we would just call it, you know, almsgiving. And the opposite of this is avarice, right? It's, it's what is it? The old, it's the old English word, you know, for, um, you know, wanting something that you don't <laughs> need, you know? Oh, Lord, why, why don't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> you know, remember uh, our teacher, Father Hopko, said, you know, you can pray to God to ask something, but be very careful because he may give it to you. He may answer your uh -huh. prayer and then you'll be sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. You know what I mean? So right, so this right. idea of charity is really a, a virtue and, and it means empathy, compassion and, and giving and that we are specifically, you know, delivered from this. It's a terrible, terrible passion. You know, this and it's very American, isn't it? You know, uh, that that ties right into our consumerism, that that we're going to feel empty and anxious. And the way to overcome that anxious emptiness is to go out and buy something. And we buy these things that we yeah. really don't need, yeah. you know. And so what our faith teaches us is that we practice charity, uh, you know, and it's the old it's from the English, from the Greek word agape. Or, or you know philanthropia by I, I I say this cutting the fact that we have we have a lot of things in our lives that we really sure. don't need and there should be a way for us to to eliminate that uh, and somehow maybe even to monetize it that's the word that we could use and then find ways where we can do good with those possessions that we have you know by by giving to those. Who are in need. And, and what it does is it challenges us to ask one question. Is this something that I need or is this something that I want? Mm -hmm. Those are two different things, what we need and, and what we want. 
but it helps us to overcome our 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 pride as just self self wanting you know th this kind of you know this passion of of having to have me I, I mean for for me it's like i'm kind of into electronics you know <laughs> if i see something you know sure. in the tech in the tech world you know my mind is going to go right there wouldn't it be nice to, <laughs> to have that new gadget you know how much yeah. is it going to cost and then i have to say do i do i need it or or do i want it you know but we we yeah. should always be pushing ourselves with god's grace in in order to you know search out those who are you know in need and and to be able to really serve them you know we just read a couple of weeks ago this this incredible famous parable of the yes. rich man and lazarus and in that yes, parable yes. You know, you have the depiction of the rich man's porch, and and I I like to call that porch uh, something of a metaphor or an allegory. The porch is the spiritual intersection in each of our lives where God sends us people to serve, people to yeah, give. Wow. You know wow. that it, we don't have to go looking for them; they're already there. They're on our porch. Yeah, yeah. And that right. porch can be literally, you know, in our home, on our neighborhood. They can be, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, an elderly person, a grandparent. Um, mm -hmm. It could be a digital porch. We might, you know, see something in, in Africa, make friends, and, and you know, we, we want to serve that way, you know, which, which um, we try to do actually at St. Luke's. We do local, we do international because we, we believe in this porch, you know. Wonderful. But there is this practice of, of charity, meaning that, we enter into the giving of God, and by giving of the good things that he has given us, I like to say, we become human again, because humans are most human when they practice charity. Well, you know, there, there's, a, there's a great, let me tell this story too, you know, sure. there's a fantastic, you know, story about this man. He's, he's a little bit wealthy. He's living in London. And he goes to his father confessor and he makes a confession. His father confessor kind of realizes that, you know, this man needs to get out of himself a little bit and start thinking about other people. And so he gives him a little bit of a, a penance. He says, I want you to find some person in your neighborhood, a straight person or, or somebody that you're going to be able to help uh, every day for 30 days. And you're going to find this person and you're going to do something for him. Maybe you'll give him a sandwich. Maybe you'll make sure that he has uh, good shoes or something. But every day you are going to find him and 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 give something to him, no matter how small it is. So this man went to confession. He did he did the penance. He came back thirty days later. Thirty days later, and he said to his his father confessor this, which I thought was great. He said, "I've done this for thirty days, but the person that I'm helping isn't any different." I haven't made it. I haven't made any difference in this person's <laughs> life, right? And right. and the the priest who was very old and very wise said, "I didn't give you that penance to help other people. I gave that penance to help you. That's good. you know, so that you yeah. can be freed, you know, from from thinking about yourself, you know, uh, uh, living in an ocean, you know, of ego, where all we're aware of is what our own wants and needs yeah. are." That's, that's the very good. deep, that's the deep, you know, that's the deep, uh, uh, the deep richness of, of a virtue like charity. We're not thinking about ourselves. We're not aware of ourselves. And we see the person that God has sent. Let, can we All talk right, a bit Father Paul, let's, 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 let's move right. on because we're, we're, we're trying to get through the list. So let's talk about mercy. Okay. okay. Mercy. We, we did. We talked about mercy and forgiveness, right? Yes, we yes, about yes. With the question. Let's let's talk Very about good. let's talk let's talk about chastity. Excellent chastity. Okay, <laughs> fine. So here here we have you know, and again, this is really you know one thing that I think everybody struggles with in life. You know, no matter who you are, where you are, where you're, a, whether you're a man or a woman, you know. But we do have this problem as Americans, you know, in in the 21st century, and, and unfortunately, you know, pornography is ubiquitous. It is everywhere, and, and um, it's just a different world in that kind of way. And the question is, how do we cultivate chastity? You know, how can mm -hmm. we keep ourselves pure and keep ourselves um, keep ourselves um, 
clean, you know, to have a clean heart. And, you know, one of the things that, first of all, the fathers teach us is, is that this is going to be a long, you know, a long struggle, you know, and in a way, you know, this is one of those, this is one of those passions where we realize that humans, humanly speaking, you know, we, we have no power to, 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 uh, to change anything. And I remember a beautiful text by, um, you know, uh, this um, Ar Archbishop Anthony Bloom. And he, he said that a young man came to him who was struggling, you know, with, with lustfulness. And the, the response that Anthony Bloom gave, gave to him has stuck with me for many years. He said, he told this young man, he said, don't give up, never give up, because that's what the devil does. He wants us to yeah. fall and he, he wants us to stay fallen. He beats us down and then he holds us down. You know, but again, practicing humility, we rise, we stand up and we repent. But when Anthony Bloom, what Anthony Bloom said was, was, was very remarkable. He said to this young man, he said, when the Lord sees that you have truly come to hate this passion, he will take it from mm. you. Right? You know, so what does that say to me? And what does that say to, to all of us? That one of the reasons that we can, you know, struggle with these things is because, you know, we have a lot to learn in terms of hating our sin, you know, hating the passions and, and, and doing so for the love of God. And it's only knowing how much that we are loved and that we're completely dependent upon God's grace that we can ever be preserved, you know, in, in this kind of state. And the other yeah, thing that's about fascinating. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that that that's fascinating because when, you know, you spoke about chastity and you, you spoke about pornography. And I think this uh, particular issue is probably something that, uh, is so entrenched or 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 rather especially young men uh yeah, and and maybe right. even young women uh that in this electronic age are so entrenched in i think that it's it's something that needs to be addressed from an orthodox standpoint in a little bit more of a um a direct way and i you know i love that you speak about the, the hatred for this sin or this action Correct, uh, yes. as being the foundation of the, you know, it, it being broken, this bond being broken, because often that is maybe, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it is really the foundation of any kind of addiction. Correct. And, you know, the, the thing is, is that the passions are, are a type of, of insanity always. The devil tricks us with a little bit of bait and switch, right? He presents something that looks very, very sweet or, 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 or very shiny, you know, and then what do we end up with? You know, misery, you know, and, and despair, you know? So, so we have to kind of recognize that, that there's, you know, there's this, you know, illusion uh, that, that belongs to it. And once we get beyond it, we realize you know, that this is uh, just one of the ways that the devil, you know, can get to us at the very core and then work that shame we were talking about, you know. Okay, um, Father Paul, work. let's let's yeah. move on because we, we, we're coming What's to that? the end of the show. Let's move on to diligence. Very good. Okay, so uh, diligence is really actually probably one of the hardest, the most difficult virtues, uh, because it involves hmm. obedience. And, and the old Latin word is fortitude. You know, the Lord says in the gospel, remember that he who endures to the end yeah, will yeah, yeah. be saved. And again, you know, in, in the book of Revelations, the second chapter, I think, uh, verse 10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a paradox here because we realize that because of our sinfulness, none of us is faithful. We are not faithful. We, we sin every day. 
the only one who is faithful is Christ, right? You know, in, that's even one of his names in the letter to the Hebrews, you know, uh, at the book of Revelation, the one who is faithful and true. But how are we faithful? By what we just mentioned briefly, by repenting and coming back over and over again and again. You know, like the widow who comes to plead before mm. the judge and will not give up, right? That's what the Lord loves. So there is this kind of diligence that has to do also with um, uh, uh, being committed to, to finishing the course, but also diligence has to do with doing little things well. You know, doing mm. little things beautifully and diligently, you know? And, and that's something that when we, you know, start to drift away, you know, we, we drift away from uh, the love of uh, love our, our Lord because we become forgetful. And, and we become forgetful, you know, because we were not being diligent to our prayer life, you know? Um, right. So it, it's, the, it's about doing little things well. And I also, you know, have defined that in an even more granular kind of way, which is this. Being diligent means doing the right thing at the right time and for the right reason. Good. Right? For Good. the right reason. And, and to take those three things and to actually do that, which is really to do God's will, but to do the, do the right thing at the right time for the right reason, you know, is literally a crucifixion uh, of, of the will. <laughs> So you know. is is the passion that is paired with this then what slothfulness yep. or lethargy, um, laziness, okay. and slothfulness? See. Correct. See. Okay. Correct. All right. Yeah. Very good, Father. Let's let's move on to the next one. Gratitude. Very good. So you know, gratitude also is something that we all of these virtues that we're talking about. It's an inner disposition right? Especially, you know, we're talking about humility, but there's an external or outer practicing that we do. You know, when we confess our sins out loud, when we confess our sins out loud to the priest in the sacrament of holy confession, we're practicing mm -hmm. humility. And that's, you know, that's, that's something that we do bodily. We, we, we do it with our, with our mouth. Gratitude as well, you know, is a way of remembering every great thing that God has done for us personally and corporately, of course, in the church, and then offering him this unique type of praise, which is thanks, right? And so what I really believe is that um, it, it's helpful to kind of be practical. Let's, let's make a, a gratitude list. And I give this to my clients all the time. You remember when I was talking about the, the mind super gluing itself to negative things we only okay. remember the negative things that have happened to us and and so we begin to paint by numbers with all of those negative things and we come up with a, a view of our lives that is is you know negative but we don't see the, the the beautiful numbers you know that are there as well and that actually outnumber you know all of those negative things so what i do is is to have people call forth and, and to be very specific about what they're thankful for with every little thing, you know, every little thing. Yeah, it thing. seems, it seems like this particular virtue comes with maturity for, yeah. for some reason. I don't know why, um, young people seem to ignore this entirely. Uh, and I yeah. think maybe we've all been there, you know, where we we are unaware of all the things that our parents have done for us, right. that other people right. do for us, and somehow gratitude is is not present within uh, younger people. Would you and, and our culture, would you agree even, with that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think our culture has become very much a a culture of of you know what we deserve, what we think we deserve. You know, and, yes. and when we feel that life has 
you know, somehow jilted us, then of course we're going to be very jaded. And that leads to that entitlement. 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 Yeah. You know, but you know, Uh, there is this, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and go to the last uh, virtue, uh, certainly not the least, and that is patience. Patience. Very good. So marriage is a school of patience, isn't it? You know, <laughs> living in our families is, is a school of patience. And I really yeah. believe that in our Orthodox tradition, we, we do not have really uh, any kind of, I don't want to say we don't have a place, but we, we just don't see single, single individuals there kind of going at uh, living their life. You know, there's always the family or there's always the monastery. And they're 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 both kind of families. We do have single people, of course, but you know we we're we're hoping that you know actually our parishes become their families in this kind of surrogate way, which is you know really wonderful. Um, but I, I do feel that you know um, we have these people that live under our roof and that you know are our own flesh and blood, and when we live with them for a long time. You know, we see not only the wonderful things, the beautiful things, the great things, the successful things, but we also uh, come to see, of course, you know, what, what our, you know, what our sins are, what, what our, you know, vices are, what our bad habits are. And if we're really going to practice humility, we're not going to judge. If we're really going to, to be diligent, you know, we're, we're going to continue to love them and, and to serve them. You know, and, and in this kind of way, you know, practicing patience means, um, you know, um, uh, participating again in, in this love of God, which is, you know, in the Greek, makrothemia, the word long suffering. We have to be able to bear with one another and so fulfill the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, we've both raised teenagers and, and we know that that. That's also uh, involving, you know, a whole lot of patience, correct? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Father yeah. Paul, so um, let, thank you so much for your patience uh, with me tonight and with explaining so carefully uh, how we can win the virtues. Uh, one last question uh, before we wrap up this evening, and that is, I think a lot of people come to confession, um, mm. I, I, I think maybe somewhat uh, exasperated or maybe discouraged, uh, maybe that's the better word, discouraged that they are not able to cultivate the virtues that they, they want. I don't know mm-hmm. why I keep doing this, or I don't know yeah. why I'm not generous, I- I- very generous. I don't know why I'm so impatient. Uh, what do you say? How do you address someone who is discouraged in their attempting to win and acquire these virtues and, and really have a, a transformative and a, a change in their life? Good, and this is the way we can kind of best drive this home. Let, let's reemphasize one thing, that it's the love of God that motivates us to grow, right? We, we never lose hope because of, of God's love that has been shown to us in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as long as we have that love, and I mentioned that love as being the foundation of, of our of our being of the of the core being that we have then we are going to be discouraged there are going to be moments and periods in our life we're going to we're going to feel really low you know i in in my confession my uh i tell my people that we talk about this all the time at at saint luke's is that you know the devil's two favorite you know the devil's two favorite words you know are why bother you know, why bother <laughs> with any of this if if it's not doing any good or not doing the good that yeah, I want it right. to do? But remember this, too, that the Lord is, again, we were talking about being tested and that he wants us to be diligent and to keep on, you know, the Girl Scout motto, keep on keeping on. 
you know, and that yes. we may not see the long view of it, but there there is growth and there there is there is healing. And maybe we can conclude by just quoting that beautiful verse from the parable of the sower, where Christ explains the meaning of the parable to his disciples. And he says, those are they who bear 100 fold in a good and patient heart with patience and goodness, right? So, I mean, I, I really love that quote, you know, that this yes, doesn't yes. happen overnight. It may not even happen over a few years. You know, we are, we are in this, you know, for, for a very, you know, a uh, long, you know, uh, a long, a long time. And, and the devil is the one who wants us to take the short view, in which case yeah. we're not going to see the progress that we want to see. And that's also kind of hidden pride. I, I think, but but our calling is simply, you know, never to lose hope, to to always beg God to uh, uh, reveal His love to us, because it's that love that carries us, and it's His love that is grace, literally the grace that lifts us, you know, out of these kind of more these this morass, you know, of of our sins, you know, that that we can be so we can be so entrenched and we can be entrenched for so long. Um, but, you know, remember that I like to say that this is where God's greatest miracles happen. You know, we say that he is the, the, the hope of the hopeless. It's another beautiful, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful prayer, uh, Indeed. you know, and, and, and that's why, you know, we have these things. So, um, these are the virtues and, 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 um, uh, we are so gifted. We are so blessed in our church to to have this kind of, like I said, clear sighted understanding of of what these mean. Not only what they mean, Indeed. why they're so valuable, but how we can acquire them. Indeed, Father Paul, thanks for reminding us that uh, this is a winnable war. Yes, this this is. Uh, uh, our ability by God's grace to go through this lifelong struggle to cultivate these virtues, to suppress our passions and and to live uh, to be like God uh, is really truly the the good fight that we're called to uh, fight. Father Paul yeah. Janakis, once again, thank you so much for thank joining you, us Father tonight. Thomas. Thank you so much and, and I really love your show and and again it, it is it is my honor. And speaking about gratitude, I, I'm so grateful um, that, that you've invited me to be on your show. We love you, too. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, before I share a few final thoughts, I again want to offer my sincere thanks to Father Paul for joining us tonight. Thanks to Bobby for engineering the program, to our show production assistant, Melissa Graff, for her work behind the scenes and booking guests, everybody that's listening in and those who will be listening. I wanted to close with a short quote from Abba Dorotheus, I believe this is from the Philokalia, and he writes, when someone is either good to us or we bear evil from someone, we must look to the hills and thank God for everything that is happening to us, always reproaching ourselves and saying, as the Father said, that if something good happens to us, then this is God's providence, but if bad, then it is because of our sins because truly everything which we have to bear, we bear because of our sins. The saints, if they suffer, suffer for God's name, or in order that their virtues be revealed for the sake of many others, or that their crowns and rewards from God might be increased. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ancientfaithtoday. Share out our program after that's posted. Give us your feedback and contact us with any ideas or topics that you might want to hear about. Join us next Tuesday evening for another edition of Ancient Faith Today. Good night, everybody.